Okay, so my name is Dr. James Nicolantonio. I'm going to be discussing omega-6 seed oils as a driver of cardiovascular disease. So what exactly are omega-6 seed oils? They are essentially oils that are high in the polyunsaturated fat linoleic acid, which is an omega-6 fat. And here you can see examples of these omega-6 seed oils, safflower, sunflower, corn, cottonseed, soybean, sesame, peanut, and canola, also known as rapeseed. Now, because these oils are high in the omega-6 fat linoleic acid, they are high in polyunsaturated fats, which have multiple double bonds, and this means they are easily oxidized. And that's really the problem with these oils, is particularly cooking with them, which uh, increases their oxidation products. So essentially what you have is you have the starting omega-6 seed oil. And, and the, the source of these are really, um, you know, basically things that really shouldn't be providing a lot of oil. So it takes a lot of things like high heat and hexane to actually extract the oils. And because of this, that actually leads to an oxidized oil. Now, furthermore, there are other basically processes before the finished product ends up on the shelf. There's degumming and, and caustic lye refining. There's hydrogenation, bleaching, de-waxing and winterization, deodorization, and then finally you get your bulk oils and essentially your shortenings and margarines. And by this time, these oils are highly oxidized. So what does this mean from an actual clinical perspective if we cook with these oils? Well, there's been a couple studies at least um, looking at this topic. Um, the first study compared um, oils like extra virgin olive oil and to these omega-6 seed oils like canola, rice bran, grapeseed, peanut, and sunflower. Now, the first study was to look actually at the stability of the oil by gradually heating the oil in the pan, um, basically in frying it between 77 degrees Fahrenheit upwards of 464 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the second test was to look at the oxidation products that were formed when heating the oil um, for 350 at 356 degrees Fahrenheit for up to six hours. So what you see here in the first study is the oxidative stability. And essentially the omega-6 fats are the least stable out of all the fats tested upon cooking. So essentially the second study then decided to look at oxidation products that are formed, which they looked at what are called polar compounds. These are essentially lipid peroxides and aldehydes that are formed. And essentially what you can see here is that the omega-6 fats were the, the worst in regards to increasing these polar compounds upon cooking. And really the three um, worst omega-6 fats were um, sunflower, grapeseed, and canola, even at a, they had fairly high um, uh, starting points of, of polar compounds. Even uh, cooking them, you know, just for a few minutes, they had fairly high amounts of polar compounds. So the takeaway from these studies is that really omega-6 seed oils, they're an unstable oil to cook with and they form the greatest amount of oxidation products. Now, there are other pathways for how omega-6 fats lead to uh, numerous different diseases. This was a, a video that I had uh, presented a, a few months ago, basically showing how you have this, your starter omega-6 seed oil, which gets attacked by air heat, hexane, and even stomach acid, which leads to both unoxidized and oxidized omega-6 products. And you can absorb these oxidation products, these lipid hydroperoxides and aldehydes, but these can even form in the body as well. When they're absorbed in the intestine, they can get into the cell membranes and oxidize the cell membranes, which can lead to cellular dysfunction and death. And then this can lead to chronic disease and numerous target organ uh, system dysfunctions like Alzheimer's, fatty liver disease, heart disease, eye disease, and kidney damage. And then through a separate pathway, we can absorb these oxidized fats into chylar microns in our lipoproteins, and this can oxidize all lipoproteins. We even absorb the, uh, the omega-6 into our white blood cells, and this is a blown up view of LDL, and essentially what happens is these lipid hydroperoxides, these aldehydes, even um, there's one aldehyde called malandialdehyde, which can covalently bind to ApoB, and when that happens, the LDL is no longer recognized by the liver LDL receptor, 
so it remains out in the blood longer and it's now recognized by the scavenger receptors on our macrophages and this can lead to foam cell formation and atherosclerosis which can then lead to cardiovascular disease like heart attacks and strokes so that's a it's a little bit of a complex but simplified view of what's going on a little bit more of a blown up view of this here you have native LDL, which doesn't really seem to be a problem. Our liver produces this for numerous reasons. LDL helps to deliver nutrients, including even omega-3s to um, uh, the eyes. And you can see here that when you saturate the LDL with omega-6, it increases its oxidation and its susceptibility to oxidation. You saturate the white blood cells, which leads to an increased release of reactive oxygen species, and this leads to oxidized LDL. And it's really the oxidized LDL that's particularly atherogenic. It's chemotactic, meaning it signals the white blood cells to basically come in um, into the vasculature to form uh, basically these foam cells because they take up the LDL. Now, what's the difference between omega-6 and omega-3 in regards to their effects uh, in the body? Well, what's interesting is that actually the consumption of omega-6 uh, linoleic acid, particularly from cooked seed oils, omega-6 seed oils, increases the metabolism of arachidonic acid, which is a long chain omega-6. Now, it's not that arachidonic acid is bad per se. It's when you start metabolizing it to its pro-arrhythmic, platelet-activating, vasoconstricting, pro-inflammatory metabolites, that's the problem. Essentially, when you start activating COX and LOX enzymes and form these harmful products off of arachidonic acid. And there are studies showing that increasing the intake of these omega-6 seed oils will increase the pro-inflammatory, um, pro-arrhythmic metabolites of arachidonic acid. And omega-3 has more anti-arrhythmic, anti-inflammatory, platelet-inhibiting metabolites. And in fact, linoleic acid can actually replace omega-3 in the cell membrane as well. So you're depleting omega-3 with linoleic acid and you're increasing the metabolism of omega-6 arachidonic acid to its pro-inflammatory metabolites with consuming omega-6 seed oils. So that's just another mechanism of how these omega-6 seed oils can lead to cardiovascular disease. So what can you do about it? Well, uh, one study by Chris Ramsden and colleagues actually showed that simply lowering the dietary intake of linoleic acid will reduce oxidized linoleic acid metabolites in humans. Um, so you can see here that after 12 weeks of a low uh, linoleic uh, acid intake, so basically at baseline they were consuming about 7% of their energy from dietary linoleic acid, and they dropped that down to just 2.42%, or basically a 64% reduction in dietary linoleic acid. And you see all these plasma oxidized linoleic acid metabolites all are significantly reduced. So in other words, simply reducing dietary linoleic acid leads to decreases in oxidized linoleic acid metabolites. And this is what's really harmful in the body. Are these, uh, you know, basically lipid hydroperoxides, these oxidized linoleic acid metabolites and aldehydes as well. So the old dogma is that omega-6 linoleic acid is good for us because it can decrease LDL and uh, levels and this should hopefully reduce heart disease. But the new paradigm is that these omega-6 seed oils actually increase the oxidation of all lipoproteins, may even increase small dense LDL, which has been shown in a few studies. And this actually is how it can increase coronary heart disease. And this matches the clinical studies as well that have uh, looked at basically comparing uh, dietary intakes of animal fat versus omega-6 seed oils and the omega-6 seed oils showing harm. Now, are we even consuming a lot of these omega-6 seed oils for this to be a, an issue? And this is a great paper that really shows the trends in consumption. And you can see here starting in the 19, 1960s, and we really actually, and I'll show you in a few other slides, that really around 1940 is where you see a lot of the increase in omega-6 seed oils, particularly soybean oil, starts to take place. But even 20 years after that, you can see this dramatic doubling of the increase in the intake of vegetable oils per day, going from 22.7 uh, grams all the way up to 48.1. And this is basically, um, you can see most of this is being driven um, in the developed world versus the developing world isn't as big. But 
it's this trend, this doubling that you can see here um, that's particularly harmful. And essentially, we went from consuming just 11 grams of linoleic acid, which is still high compared to the 40s, 1940s. Um, we, we more than doubled that, going to 24 grams of linoleic acid per day. Now, as I said previously, this is in the 1940s, early 1940s, is really where we see the takeoff of omega-6 seed oil skyrocket, pr primarily driven through the consumption of soybean oil. Essentially, the intake of uh, soybean oil and, and these vegetable oils went from zero, you know, basically in the 30s, to over 25 pounds per person per year. And so essentially, you know, by the late 90s, we were consuming about, you know, over 31 grams of soybean oil per person per day. And so to give this more um, perspective in regards to total caloric intake, there, there's about a threefold increase in linoleic acid intake from 1909 to 1999. So we went from linoleic acid just making up 2.3% of total calories going all the way to actually greater than 7%. And we actually see a match in the dietary intake to increases in linoleic acid stored in the adipose tissue. So basically in, in 1955, we had less than 10% of our adipose tissue being made up of linoleic acid. And then by 2005, you know, basically a quarter of that fat is now linoleic acid. So there was you know, close to a threefold increase in linoleic acid in adipose tissue, adipose tissue basically matching that, that threefold increase. Uh, in dietary intake. Now, from a sort of evolutionary perspective, you know, what did we consume as Paleolithic hunter-gatherers in regards to the omega-6 to 3 ratio? And, you know, we had a good balance of omega-6 to omega-3. Essentially, our Paleolithic ancestors consumed basically a 1 to 1 ratio, which is a similar ratio that was consumed in Greece prior to the 1960s. And um, Japan is known also for a fairly low omega-6 to 3 ratio, just 4 to 1. And, and pre, prior to basically 1960, they had very low rates of uh, heart disease as well. But, you know, current United States and UK, you're looking at, you know, 15 to 20 to 1 uh, in favor of omega-6 to omega-3. And then in urban India, there was a dramatic increase in basically going from, you know, from rural areas of just 5 to 6 to 1 to 38 to 50 to 1. So, you know, it's a shift too in the increase in linoleic acid, but also a decrease in omega-3 as well. So where is this omega-6 coming from? Well, what's interesting is that you can see here and how much as well, starting from 1909, we have really good, basically, um, data, historical data on the increase in the intake of uh, vegetable oils. Uh, in, compared to animal fats, you know, you see animal fats basically from 1909 to 1972, basically, you know, about 100 grams per day is where um, those animal fats came from. Whereas vegetable sources of fats went from just 20 grams per day, tripled again to 60. So, so numerous different data basically corroborate each other that there was a tripling of um, basically linoleic acid from 1909 to 1972. And, you know, sort of breaking it out on where the sources of these omega-6 fats, a lot of it came from salad dressings and cooking oils is where most of it uh, increased. You can see that here very, uh, very nicely graphically, whereas you can see, you know, um, butter and, and things actually decreasing in intake, whereas um, the omega-6 uh, fats, particularly from salad dressings and cooking oils, are what's increasing from 1909 to 1972 in regards to um, fats in oils. So again, this would suggest that it's these omega-6 uh, salad, omega-6 omega seed oils um, from salad dressings and cooking oils that's driving the epidemics that we saw in regards to increases in cardiovascular disease um, in the early 1900s and mid-1900s. And this is just an, a different way to look at this data. Um, showing that from the 1950s to 1975, you see basically a doubling in the intake of salad and cooking oils. Whereas, you know, your original cooking fats, animal fats are stable here. And again, um, this is just basically showing that the butter basically was cut in half, the intake of butter. Um, and that really was replaced with margarine from 1950 to 1970. And then looking at pie charts as well, just another way to look at this. 
And this is actually looking at 1960 to 1985. So giving you just a little bit of a later scope as well. You can see here that most of the pi, most of the increase are, are these two sections here, which is essentially, essentially you have your salad oils, salad dressings, which are very high in omega-6 and your shortenings too. You see basically the shortenings which have the uh, omega-6 and the salad dressings are taking up almost basically 75% of the fats that are being consumed in the United States. So essentially, by 1972, over 20 grams of linoleic acid was being consumed per person per day in the United States. And you can see um, graphically, this is linoleic acid, just a stepwise increase from 1909 to 1972. And again, looking at other fats, we see here, um, you know, oleic acid is, is stable. Animal fats are actually going down. The total saturated fat slightly going down from 1909 to 1972. It's the vegetable fats and oils and the linoleic acid that's increasing. Now, even if we saw an increase in saturated fats, um, we there's numerous populations that eat a lot of saturated fat that have a lack of coronary heart disease or low coronary heart disease, um, such as the French paradox. And just this is another example of an absence of coronary thrombosis in Navajo Indians, despite eating a lot of saturated fat. So if saturated fat was the issue like meat, lard, eggs, butter, milk, we, we should see a lot of coronary thrombosis in Navajo Indians and it was simply absent. So the point is, is that if it's not the saturated fat, then it's likely the vegetable oil, since those are the fats that were basically increasing in consumption. Now, how exactly do omega-6 fats cause heart disease? Well, there's, I'm going to go over some of the mechanisms of how this happens. And essentially, it's again, these oxidized linoleic acid metabolites. Now you see in healthy individuals, this is um, LDL samples of healthy uh, volunteers, 22 to 60 years old, very low levels of oxidized linoleic acid. But if you look at atherosclerotic patients, they have very high levels of these oxidized linoleic acid metabolites. You know, anywhere from basically a 10 micrograms per gram in LDL, all the way upwards of 50, which is much higher than what we saw in the previous slide of 0.5 to one. So we see here that atherosclerotic coronary heart disease patients have high amounts of oxidized um, linoleic acid metabolites in their LDL. And so that's, that's very interesting. And you can see here across the board though, triglycerides aren't always necessarily high in these individuals. Cholesterol isn't necessarily very high. And this is a cholesterol of only 208, but you can see consistently here, very high levels of oxidized um, linoleic acid metabolites. And you can see heart disease can be in individuals with high HDL and LDL um, as well. Uh, doesn't have to be super high, you know, 127, 126. Those aren't super high uh, levels of LDL per se. And what you can see here, again, too, um, different graphical uh, of oxidized linoleic acid products, that in healthy volunteers, they're not elevated. As you get older, they certainly become elevated, and, um, which makes sense, and this is in healthy uh, people. But then in atherosclerotic patients, you see early on, um, even in the mid-30s and 40s, um, that these individuals have elevated levels of oxidized linoleic acid metabolites. So that's the key difference here. Healthy people don't have those oxidized linoleic acid metabolites. Atherosclerotic patients do. Now, let's take a look at the, uh, the susceptibility of LDL to oxidation. When humans consume different fats, which fat makes the LDL more susceptible to oxidation? And this is a really um, a, a great paper showing the lag time, which is basically how long it takes for the LDL to oxidize. And it's the longest with olive oil, and it's the shortest with the omega-6 fat sunflower oil. So right here, um, individuals who consume these oils, when we're looking at their LDL oxidation, it's the omega-6 fats that have a very low lag time. They oxidize very quickly is what this graph is showing. And it's showing, this is the opposite, this is the rate of actual oxidation products in LDL, which is the highest in the omega-6 fats. And we can see this again in other studies. These are, this is in mildly hypercholesterolemic patients. And what you can see here is the two different diets. They, they were given an omega-6 linoleic acid, a high diet versus a, a diet higher in oleic acid. And you can see here that 
in the LDL, the linoleic acid basically you know, you know, increases by about 50% in the linoleic acid diet, whereas there's actually a reduction in the oleic acid diet. So in other words, dietary omega-6 increases omega-6 in LDL dramatically, and you can see that here in this graph. And essentially, there's an increase in the oxidation of the omega-6 in the LDL, which leads to all the oxidation products in LDL, when you consume a diet higher in linoleic acid compared to oleic acid. And um, there are higher lipid hydroperoxides, as you can see here, in the linoleic acid supplemented diet and lower in the um, oleic acid diet. And what's interesting too is they looked at macrophage, basically degradation of the LDL. Um, so when the LDL oxidizes, our macrophage is basically migrating towards this LDL, which is what would happen in, um, in humans, right? And so they see a larger macrophage degradation of the oxidized LDL in the omega-6 diet compared to the oleic acid diet. Now again, this is kind of showing the same thing, but in, in broken down even better, looking at um, unoxidized and oxidized linoleic acid between the diets. And you can see that you start out with basically a lot of unoxidized omega-6. And afterwards, when the LDL is oxidized, all that omega-6 decreases in the LDL because it becomes oxidized. So in people with heart disease, you would expect them to have a low omega-6 content in their LDL because it's being oxidized. And this, what this is showing really too, is that it's the omega-6 fats that are going down. The arachidonic acid and the linoleic acid, both of those are the ones that are dramatically being depleted during LDL oxidation. None of the other fats, this is not happening with, uh, not even close compared to these. And this is just another graphical depiction showing that omega-6 oxidizes in LDL, whereas oleic acid is stable. So you see here that basically the level of linoleic acid after oxidation dramatically decreases. And same with arachidonic acid after LDL oxidation, but the oleic acid uh, doesn't during LDL oxidation. So when LDL oxidizes, it's omega-6 both the linoleic acid and the arachidonic acid that are oxidizing because their levels are dramatically de uh, decreasing and we know their oxidation products are also increasing. Now, the more linoleic acid in LDL, actually the greater the lipid hydroperoxide level as well. And so as you go from 30% uh, to 60% linoleic acid in LDL, there's just this basically linear increase in uh, conjugated ions, which are lipid hydroperoxides in LDL. And there's other human studies corroborating this as well from uh, Greek subjects. You can see here that there's increased conjugated dienes, which is um, basically, uh, you know, aldehydes in subjects on the linoleic acid diet versus a decrease in those products in LDL with oleic acid. And same thing again here, um, just different depictions of that. And another uh, nice study too showing increased monocyte chemotaxis to the LDL with a linoleic acid, which is basically you know, indicating greater foam cell formation uh, versus the oleic acid. Now, one question that we were, weren't sure of is basically are oxidized lipids from the diet an actual source of oxidized lipids in the human body? And this study really was one of the you know, pioneer studies showing this, that essentially, yes, when you consume oxidized lipids, they do get into the chylomicrons, which will then be delivered to the liver and can get into other lipoproteins. But what this shows is that it's, as you increase the oxidation of the oil, um, there's an increase in lipid oxidation in chylomicrons. So exogenous dietary sources of oxidized lipid increases the oxidation of those oils in chylomicrons. And you can see that here, if you have a low oxidized oil, um, you don't have as much um, basically increase in concentration, whereas you get much higher concentrations um, with basically higher oxidized oil. And this is basically just showing that again, that there's less accumulation of 
conjugated dienes in chylomicrons when you have a lower um, oxidized oil versus a higher oxidized oil. So what this study basically concluded is that when humans are fed a test meal containing oxidized lipids, they get into the chylomicrons. And what's really interesting is that um, basically there was an approximate five-fold increase uh, when they consumed oils high in those oxidized fats. And they are absorbed in the intestine. They're transported to the chylomicrons um, to the circulation where they can contribute to the total body pool of oxidized lipids. So this study was just um, super compelling. And what does this mean? This essentially means that when you have oxidized linoleic acid, when you, when you cook with these seed oils, that this can get into the chylomicrons and, and um, other lipoproteins and oxidize those as well. That it's the oxidized oils that are much more toxic and atherogenic. And there were other studies actually looking at this, um, looking at uh, polyunsaturated fats that were heated for 20 minutes at uh, about 400 degrees Fahrenheit, that they're much more atherogenic in animals than unheated oils. And similar experiments have been done with um, olive oil, uh, which doesn't seem to oxidize readily and doesn't lead to atherosclerosis with heated olive oil. So in other words, the animal studies you know, are very compelling regarding if you heat olive oil, it doesn't lead to heart disease in animals, but you heat polyunsaturated omega-6 uh, oils, that does lead to heart disease. And so we really have animal models that are very compelling on which oils we should not be cooking with. And based on these studies, we should not be cooking with omega-6 seed oils. Now, what about actual um, you know, primate studies looking at atherosclerosis, comparing you know, animal fats to omega-6 seed oils? Well, this is interesting. A lot of the animal studies do show that um, animal fats lead to more um, atherosclerotic plaque. But when you actually look at the plaque, okay, so you can see here that when they were fed lard, there was more, technically more um, plaque, but it's the omega-6 seed oils lead to twice as much um, basically soft fatty plaque, which is what's likely to actually break off and lead to coronary thrombosis. So this is the plaque you don't wanna have, the fatty plaque. So even the primate studies that went out five years really show that you have a thinner fibrous cap, okay, with omega-6 seed oils, and you have a lot more of the fatty unstable streaks. Whereas um, whereas with lard and animal fat, it's mostly just a fatty streak, not a fatty plaque. And, it, and the animal fats lead to a much thicker fibrous cap, which is, means it's more stable, less likely to break off. Now, what about humans? If we look at randomized controlled studies in humans on plaque stability, well, we see the same thing as we see with the animal primate studies. The sunflower oil leads to basically less fibrous cap compared to control and certainly compared to the fish oil. A more thin, uh, thin fibrous cap atheroma, uh, you know, almost 30%, whereas control was just 22.8 and only 15% thin fibrous cap with fish oil. And higher plaque rupture which is, so this is what really matters too, and less cal calcified plaques. Now calcified plaques are stable, and that's why there was a higher uh, plaque rupture in the sunflower oil group um, than in the uh, fish oil group or the uh, control. So this is pretty compelling, I and mean, this is human data looking at basically showing that, you know, omega-6 seed oils lead to more thin fibrous cap atherosclerosis and more plaque rupture, less stabilized calcified plaques. And this is another um, interesting study actually looking at the odds ratio of basically developing new um, heart lesions. And it was the dietary intake of omega-6 polyunsaturated fat that led to the largest odds ratio of having new atherosclerotic lesion development. You didn't, really, you didn't see anything really robust from the other fats. And this is what's really compelling too, is there's a stepwise increase in that odds ratio with increasing intake of omega-6 polyunsaturated fat. So as it goes from zero to over 11%, the odds ratio of developing a new atherosclerotic lesion goes from one to over 12 fold. Um, so that's extremely compelling.
Now, what about actual human studies on heart endpoints like heart attacks, strokes, cardiovascular events, all cause mortality? The human studies also show that compared to even animal fats plus trans fats, that omega-6 fats are more harmful. So the, the margarine study, there were more um, cardiovascular events. In the anti-coronary club, which compared to omega-6 fats to animal fats, there were about four times more all-cause deaths and eight times more coronary heart disease deaths. The rose corn study, basically only 52% were alive at the end of the study on the omega-6, whereas uh, those in the animal fat group, 75% were uh, alive. So that's, that's huge. That's like, you know, an increase in all-cause mortality of like a third. The Sydney Diet Heart Study, um, there were significant increases in all-cause mortality of 62%. And these are, this is a randomized controlled study. Uh, cardiovascular death increased by 70% and coronary heart disease death increased by 74%. And then in the Minnesota Coronary Survey, uh, this is another randomized study as well. Coronary heart disease death was increased by uh, 28%. Non-fatal coronary heart disease increased by 25% and death increased by 17% in women comparing the omega-6 seed oils to animal fats. And then Chris Ramson has three meta-analyses basically showing the same thing, increased coronary heart disease death, all-cause death, and heart attacks with the consumption of omega-6 seed oils. And this is just a screenshot of one of those meta-analyses basically showing you what I just presented, that when you replace the combination of animal fats and trans fats with these omega-6 seed oils, you see increases in the rates of death from all causes, coronary heart disease and cardiovascular disease. So I didn't want you to just take my word for it. Here's an actual snapshot of the abstract of that meta-analysis. Okay, so to summarize, linoleic acid is highly susceptible to oxidation, which is the primary fat found in these omega-6 seed oils. Oxidized linoleic acid contributes to cardiovascular disease and omega-6 seed oil consumption leads to increases in oxidized LDL, coronary heart disease, cardiovascular disease, and all-cause mortality. That is the end of the presentation.